So we've been thinking about this statement that Jesus made, that he made to you, that he made to me in the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever recorded. And in the context of all the things that all of us need in life, Jesus simplified and helped us prioritize. And he said, yeah, I know that you need sustenance. I know that you need food. I know that you need somewhere to live. I know that you need shelter. I I know that you need provision, but here's the priority. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 6. We've looked at it every week of this journey together. He said, for the pagans run after all these things. Even the people who don't have a concept of the living God, they're all going after all these things. But he said, your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first, that's our phrase, seek first, that's priority, his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, God is putting an invitation on the table today. That's mind-boggling to me, honestly, because we're here, we're all, you know, found our way to a parking place, got into the building, or maybe you're linking in online from home and joining church today from who knows where, and we're all here, but can we just wrap our heads around this reality today? The God of heaven is putting opportunities on the table. He's putting invitations on the table. He's saying, look, if you will choose to prioritize my kingdom and my righteousness, everything else you need in 2022, I'm going to add that to you. So the things on your list that you think you need this year, some of those you do need, and I'm going to provide those because I already knew that. But there's a whole lot of things you need in 2022 that you don't even know that you need yet. And I already know what all those things are. And I am working to provide those for your life. I'm just saying, if you will put God first, I will put everything else in your life that you need. And so we've been looking at the simplicity of this, put God first. And honestly, it's not a big, giant theological concept. It's a simple, practical way of life. And that's what God wants for all of us. He wants this to become a way of life, like breathing. Sometimes you're thinking about it, sometimes you're not, but you're always doing it. It's a way of life. And that's what God wants as we think about what it means to put the kingdom first and put the king first. So this is part two of put God first. Super practical. And I believe God's got a word for every single one of us today. Number one, put God first in your rising. You're like, what does that mean? When you wake up, put God first. In other words, before you reach for your phone or reach for your alarm or do anything else, just pause and be grateful, like we've already heard today, that I'm alive. Shelly and I have a friend who uh, works at a restaurant we frequent um, in our neighborhood, and I've known him for a long, long, long time. He's sort of a, a fixture in Atlanta restaurant culture. And every time I will see him, I I just ask him because I know his answer is going to be, I'll say, "Uh, hey, Byron, how you doing? And he'll say, I woke up. (laughs) That's a whole summary of gratitude. I woke up. Hey, I'm doing good. I'm here. I'm alive. I have a new day, a new opportunity. I woke up. And so when we wake up, I want to encourage you in the simplicity before you do one thing to put God first. In other words, acknowledge him when you are conscious that you have a new day. So whenever that moment happens that you're coming out of the fog, uh, maybe you're one of those people that wakes up immediately and you're conscious, and maybe you're one of those people that takes about an hour to get fully conscious. But when you become conscious that it's Tuesday and I have a new day, put God first. You say, well, what would that look like? It just means simply saying, before I reach for my phone to check whatever it is I need to check, before I step out of the bed, before I have my first thought of trying to organize what's coming, I just want to stop and acknowledge God. I want to thank you for a new day. I want to worship you because you're a good God. I want to put you first today, God. In this day... I want to put God first. That's what the psalmist was saying in Psalm 127. 
when he says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In other words, if you wake up and the first thing you do is start thinking about what you need to build that day, you may be on the path to having a day that at the end of the day doesn't last forever. If you're building the house, then all of that ultimately is going to be in vain. If you're waking up thinking, here's what I got to do at work today. Here's what I need to do to lead my people today. Here's how I need to organize my kids today. Here's what I need to to, to, to get rolling today. And that's your first thing. That's what you put first. Then you're building the house. But if you can pause and say, God, I just want to put you first today before I go build anything or watch anything or try to protect anything, I want to put God first. Look how the psalmist finishes this. He said, it's vain for you to rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. And so I want to encourage you, put God first in your rising, and secondly, put God first in your setting. When you wake up, put God first, and the last thing you do before you close your eyes, don't go through the list again. Don't replay all the things you regret about today. Don't go through and work out all of what you got to do tomorrow. When you close your eyes, put God first and say, God, At the end of this day, I want to thank you from when we started this morning and I acknowledged you and I worship you for being a good God to the very end of this day now that I'm closing my eyes in sleep. I want to acknowledge you again and thank you for this day and trust you in this night. The text says that he gives sleep to those he loves, but a better way of reading this verse is that he gives to those he loves in their sleep. And so what if we just do those two simple things? We put God first in our rising and we put God first in our setting. You wake up tomorrow and you say, God, I want to put you first. Will you provide and will you guide? Will you anoint and will you appoint? Will you protect and will you correct? I want to put God first. I think the third way in a super practical way that we can put God first is to honor God in our wealth. I know that for a lot of us, you're like, whoa, that seems like a left turn. I like the starting and ending the day with God. (laughs) But we're going to hit on a couple of different areas before we close today, and they don't all necessarily correlate, but God has a specific word for every one of us today. I met a guy this week that I was so fired up to meet Uh, He was this message in real life. His name is Richard. And I went to speak at an event in El Paso, Texas, and Richard was my host, our host. And so when we landed, he met us at the airport, helped us get our bags and help us get to the car, drove us to the hotel, actually drove us to lunch first, took us to lunch, went in, we had lunch together, started to learn about his story, drove us to the hotel, drove us back to the venue, back to the hotel, you get the story. He's hosting us for our time at this conference. And I thought, surely he's a pastor at the church or on the team at the church and come to find out Richard's just a a door holder. He's a volunteer at their church and he'd taken time off work to serve at this conference and to drive us around and to be our host. And he was a great host. It's like, what do you do? And he goes, well, I'm the distribution center manager for, and then he named the company, um, uh, National Furniture Chain. And he said, I run the distribution center here in El Paso, which is the regional center for our area. But as you know, El Paso is in the middle of nowhere. So it's kind of like El Paso is the region. And so he said, this is our region. And um, I've been doing that for a while now and come to find out that we heard kind of through the grapevine a little bit later that not only is he just the head of the distribution center for that region, he just got recognized as being the top region of all the regions in this national furniture chain Uh, Chicago, Orlando, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, all the big cities, he just got recognized as having the number one distribution center in all of the nation. And so he didn't tell us that right away, but 
that's the real story. And I'm like, I'm not surprised. This guy's got something going on. So we tracked through the time that we're there together and we've gone to lunch right before he's gonna drop us off at the airport. I'm just like, I wanna know more about your story. What does it mean to run a distribution center? And I got questions because I'm into operations and stuff like that. So I'm like, how big is the distribution center? How many trucks do you run on a given day? How many deliveries can a truck make in a day? What's the crew size on every truck? How much stuff can you put in a truck? Um, you know, I'm, I'm just wanting to know how do you get feedback? How do you put the dining room table in there without scratching up people's floor? Because that's what normally happens when they bring the furniture. And uh, how do you, you know, how's all this work? How do you become the best? How do you keep this thing going? I know we got supply chain issues going on all over the world. How did you get the best distribution center? What's your story? And then he says, well, you know, my story is kind of interesting. Um, I, 28 years old, had no concept of God. He goes, all I wanted to do is make money and get rich. And my family had no real faith. I had no faith. And I was married, um, trying to track through life, working as a salesman at a smaller family-owned furniture store here in El Paso. And all I wanted was to succeed financially in life. But my wife started tracking with God, and she told me that I needed to start tracking with God. And she said, Richard, you need to start reading the Bible. And I'm like, reading the Bible? I have no concept of what the Bible means and I don't understand any of it. She said, they're different translations. And she got me one, the New Living Translation, Louie, and I could understand it. And I started reading the Bible every single day. She said, one day I was sitting in a coffee shop reading Galatians 5 about the fruit of the Spirit. And I saw the fruit of the flesh and I went, oh, that's me. And then I saw the fruit of the Spirit. And I said, oh, that's what God wants me to be. And I got saved sitting in the coffee shop reading Galatians 5 about the fruit of the Spirit. God just came into my life, took over my life, saved my life right there, reading the Bible by myself. I was so moved and overwhelmed by God. I started sobbing in the coffee shop. I got all my stuff together and went out and sat in my car so I could sob in my car. He said, God saved my life, changed my life, changed me from that guy into that guy. And he said, so I started going to church, love church, never been in church in my life. And I was so pumped to go to church, but hear the next line and don't take it personally. He said, but I didn't want to just be somebody who went to church. I looked around and saw people serving the church. And I said, God, I want to serve the church. He said, but I couldn't because I was a furniture salesman. And a lot of people want to come shop for furniture on Sunday. So I could go to church, but then I had to jet so I could be a furniture salesman for the rest of the day. So I couldn't serve at church. And so I prayed and I asked God if he would give me a job that would allow me to serve at church. Whoo. Preacher sitting across the enchiladas from that. I got fired up. <laughs> I was pumped. And he said, and a few weeks went by and the owners of this family business came to me and said, Richard, we've got a problem. Our warehouse is a wreck. Our deliveries are a wreck. Our, our quality of service is terrible. The team is dysfunctional. Nothing is happening. Our inventory is all jacked up. And we've, we've recognized in you the abilities that you have. And we think you would be an awesome candidate to work out our warehouse. So would you take the job as being the manager of our warehouse. He went home and told his wife, I don't know what to do. I mean, I'm out on the floor wearing a suit, selling furniture, you know, in the light. And they want me to go back in the warehouse and take a warehouse job. That sounds a little bit like a demotion. And then he said, I thought about it for another day or two. I said, no, that sounds like an answer to my prayer because the warehouse doesn't work on Sunday. He said, I took the job and I started serving God's house. And I'm still serving God's house to this day to the point that I took vacation from my job so that I could drive you guys around El Paso, Texas as a way of serving our house. He said, not too long, we had that warehouse working like perfect. Our deliveries were awesome and on time. Our service was such that the feedback coming from the customers was incredible. Our inventory worked. The place was clean. It was a total transformation. And for 15 years, I was the warehouse manager and I was killing it. He didn't say this. I'm kind of reading between the lines. <laughs> but he was doing such a good job 
that this national furniture chain recruited him and said, man, we, we know you're the best in town. We want you to be our distribution center manager. And he said, Louis, they made me a job offer so good, I could not turn it down. And for the last 10 years, I've been the distribution center manager at this area warehouse, which is a whole lot bigger operation than was going on in that smaller company. And I've just been blessed by God in such a way that I just got recognized, we did at our distribution center as being the number one, best quality, best efficiency, best bottom line, best service in the nation. He said, God has blessed me. I'm like, yeah, because you put God first. I've met so many people. I, I, I thought about it. And if this is you, please, I'm not talking into your story right now. But I met so many people over time because that's kind of the leading question when I invite someone to come to Passion City. A lot of people say, well, I'd love to come, but I have to work on Sundays. And I know there's some situations, if you're a doctor or a nurse or in a certain field or an airline pilot, that you, you can't navigate around sometimes. You're scheduled to work on Sunday. But I just thought after talking to Richard, I wonder if anybody is asking God, you know, I, I have to work on Sunday right now. This is my field. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm gifted at. These are the doors that have opened. These are the opportunities. If anybody just said, God, you know, thank you for all that, but I'd really love to serve at church. Is there a way I can use these gifts and still walk through doors like this and have the influence that I have and the opportunities that I have, but be more available to your kingdom being first and your righteousness being first in my life and just see what God might do. God is encouraging us with our opportunities to put him first. And specifically today, he's encouraging some of us, really all of us, but speaking, I think, particularly to some of us, to put God first in your wealth. You say, well, Louie, I would if I was wealthy. To which I say, you live in America. You're one of the wealthiest people on earth. Don't you hate it when people tell you that? <laughs> but it's true. We are blessed. Every one of us in this gathering is blessed. And the proverb writer says this in Proverbs 3.9. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. First fruits is the tithe. It's saying, God, thank you that you gave me the ability to plant and harvest. I, did, I went and planted good and I harvested good. Or maybe today I planted good, but the harvest wasn't as great as I wanted. Or today we planted a little and we harvested a little but it's saying, I, I started in my rising with putting God first, and in my setting, I put you first. So therefore, when my crops came, I realized that everything I have and everything I am is by the grace of God, and I want to put you first when my crops come in. See how simple that is? That's the tithe. And we get tripped up because it's in church and nobody likes the church talking about money. But I'm telling you, I'll say it again. I'll say it a hundred times here. Passion City Church has a new location in D.C. and some amazing things are about to happen there. We just opened a new location south of Atlanta at Trillith. We're online all over the, the world right now. Cumberland, this building opened during the COVID crisis of 2020. 515 is going strong today. So... All this is happening and some of you have never given. So the message today isn't, we need your money and I want to make you feel bad so that you'll give money to Passion City Church so we can get your money. We are serving every one of you today because somebody was generous, somebody had that gratitude spirit, and somebody sewed in to help build this house. So this is not Passion City saying, man, you need to give. We, we, we want you to feel bad until you give. This is God saying, if you will put me first in your wealth, I will blow your mind. I'll blow your mind. I will blow your mind. That's what Malachi 3.10 says. It says, bring the first fruit, the tithe, into the storehouse. Bring it, bring it into God's house. And then God says this, test me and see. Test me. Try me out. 
Put me on the spot and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing too great for you to receive. Do you realize there are going to be people who get to the end of their life and never receive the blessing God wanted to pour on their life because they would not put God first in their wealth? So I made enough money. I made a lot of money. We got, you know, we got some great things going. Yeah, but you have no idea what God could have done, would have done if you had put God first. And now you just have at the end of your life all the stuff that you got with your money. And you don't have the eternal investment portfolio that far exceeds anything you could dream or imagine. I felt led, so I'm gonna be pastoral for a minute. When I was praying through this message today to encourage somebody that 2022 is your year to start tithing. In a few months, I mean, just like that, we're gonna be at Above and Beyond Sunday. We're gonna be telling amazing stories of God's faithfulness. We're gonna be talking about people whose lives were changed. We're going to be, as a house, doing something that you would only do if you were saved and grateful to a great God. We're gonna give above what we normally give so that Passion City Church can go beyond where we normally go. And you are so generous in that. This last Above and Beyond season and the one in 2020, just a sign of God stirring the hearts of people. But a lot of you, a lot of you did not give into above and beyond. Because above and beyond is predicated on the idea that there is a normal to go above. And you can't give above if you don't give. And so I want to encourage you in 2022, let it be the year. You can tell your kids and your grandkids, you know what? We were not operating in God's economy as it came to our wealth until 2022. And in 2022, your mom and I made a decision, or I wasn't even married and hadn't met your mom yet. I made a decision that I was going to start honoring God with the first fruits of my labor. It it was only $27 because my labor was 270 bucks. It wasn't a lot. I'm like, what can God do with $27? But I took God at his word, I tested, and I tried, and I trusted, and man, I'm telling you, since that time until now, our whole financial world has been different. 2022 is our year. We started trusting God with our wealth. Thank you for the amens. I appreciate it so much, brother. You went out there by yourself, alone. You stayed by yourself. No one ever joined you. You just stood on your corner all alone for that entire point in my talk. And you gave me 15 amens. Spread them out. That's a fractional amen for everybody in all the gatherings. But thank you so much for that. Philip Engel, ladies and gentlemen, one of the great door holders at Passion City Church, Cumberland. And then lastly, four, honor God in your current season. This could go into a whole new series of its own. So I'll just trust the Holy Spirit. will allow this to land wherever it needs to land. If you're single right now and really want to be in a relationship, put God first in that season. If you are married right now and you're trying to hold, hold it together and keep the knot tied, put God first. Pause and stop and say, God, our marriage is unraveling. So I'm going to get down on my knees today and I'm going to put God first. What do you want me to do? What's the next step? If you're young, put God first. If you're living in a Snapchat world, put God first. If you wouldn't know Snapchat, if it was chatting at you, (laughs) put God first. If you're just getting started in life, put God first. If you're in the latter stages of life, put God first. If you're dating right now and trying to figure out the person you're with is the right person for you, put God first. And ask them to put God first. And if they don't want to put God first, then you'll have your answer right there that they're not the right person for you. Whatever season you're in, If you just got the best news, put God first. If you just got promoted, put God first. If if everybody's impressed with you right now, put God first. But if you're in the low, 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 if you're down in the valley, in the darkness, if you're in a barren season or a, a place where it seems like everything's unraveled and it's not impressed, it's depressing, 
put God first. In the highs and the peaks, put God first. If you get rewarded, put God first. If you get acknowledged, put God first. If you get elevated, put God first. If you just got a blessing, put God first. But I I really want to speak to somebody on the other side today. If you feel like you could not go lower right now, put God first. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 42, David was at a really, really low place in life. That's why I love the Psalms. The Psalms give us highs and they give us lows because life is highs and life is lows. Amen. And God's not afraid of the highs. He's not afraid of the lows. God wants to meet you on the mountaintop, but he also wants to meet you down in the valley low. And the psalmist says it this way when he's in his low. He says, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? That's one of the most well-known Psalms in scripture. But that word pant, it's not really like a gentle, oh, I see the deer out in the meadow, really wanting to spend time with God. That is not the picture here. This is a picture of a deer that's, that's run its course, that has not found a stream, that's maybe been in a fight or been on the run from a predator, and now is at the moment of absolute desperation. And this word pant means to cry out. This deer is saying, if I don't get water, I'm going to die. If I don't find what I, what I need right now, I'm not going to make it anymore. And he says, as that desperation and that deer who needs to have water or face death in that same way, God, I'm crying out to you right now from the low, 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 God, I need you. And if I can't find you, I'm not going to make it. Is anybody in that low today? I want to encourage you in that low to put God first. You see, normally down in that low spot, we, we quickly want to run to something or run to somebody or run back to somebody or run to some well that we already know is broken and isn't going to work. Or in that low, 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 we just cash it all in, don't we? And we say, I'm out. I give up. And God is saying no in the low, low, low. But the last breath you've got panting, crying, put God first. I can meet you in the low. When you're in the lowest place of all, call out to the name that is the highest of all and put God first in that season. That season might last a day, it might last a week. I don't know. I've been through barren desert, dried up heart places, painful places, struggling places, confusing places of last season. It wasn't today and I prayed some prayer and tomorrow everything cleared and the sky was blue. It was a, it was a journey, but I just want to encourage you today. God wants to encourage you today. God knows where you are today. Put God first. The psalmist eventually turned around and said in verse five, why are you downcast? Oh, my soul, why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. That's another way of saying, put God first. For I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. I'm on the run, David was. I I don't know what's up. I'm afraid, I'm confused, but I'm gonna tell myself, don't give up on God in this season. Put your hope in God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. He's saying, I'm in a low. I'm, I'm like a deer who's at the end of the run. I'm, I'm crying out, God, if I don't have you, I'm not going to make it. But wait a minute. Right here and right now, I'm going to put God first. Do you believe today that there is no low place in life that God cannot meet you and lift you and sustain you and guide you and restore you? 
and crown you with beauty. I want to show you a clip of a baptism from last Sunday at the five. I don't know if you know or not, but the five is back and the five is going. The five is amazing, by the way. Um, If you miss the morning or if you just want to come because it's a little bit uh, different every week, the five is incredible. And last Sunday at the five, we had several baptism stories we celebrated. They were all amazing. But we came to one of the stories. It was our thousandth baptism at Passion City Church. And it was Tierra's story, um, a powerful story of how the ministry of Passion City Church, um, just by the miraculous hand of God, found her life in our 515 neighborhood. And Lauren Reedy on our team is uh, sharing her baptism story. I want you to take a look and I'll come back and we'll wrap things up. All right, I'd like you to meet my friend Tiara. And Tiara grew up with amazing parents who loved Jesus. And she has such fond memories of singing in the choir with her grandmother growing up. And she decided to put her faith in Jesus at a pretty young age. And she understood what that meant. But she grew up in a military family, which means that she moved around a lot, like every three to five years. And that got harder and harder for her. And there wasn't really stability that she needed. And by the time she was her sophomore year of high school, she was depressed and straying away from her faith. So college came and she went to college in California to study fashion. And after she graduated, she decided that she wanted to be closer to family. So at that time they were living in Atlanta. So she moved to Atlanta to be with them. But when she moved to Atlanta is when Tierra said that she fell into the hands of the enemy. It was dark. It was a life of greediness and partying and working at a job that she was not proud of. Before you knew it, one bad decision after another and she found herself at her rock bottom, which was living by herself in a hotel room, struggling to make ends meet and just full of shame. But God was drawing her to a church And through some really unique circumstances, she was invited to Passion City Church and she came. And here she was reminded of who she was and she started her journey back to Jesus. But really for her, it came down to this moment by herself in her room, no one was around. And she heard God speak to her who he made her to be. And it was not this. And in that moment, she decided I'm really done with this life for real this time. And I'm turning back to Jesus. And she did. That's right, Jesus did not give up on her and neither did her parents. Her parents had been standing in the gap praying for her to turn from her ways and come back to Jesus. So as she stands here today to get baptized, she obviously wants to take this minute to thank Jesus for what he's done in her life, but honestly, she wants to publicly honor her parents who are here today for not giving up on her. So thank you for praying for her. It's so evident in your life that you have had praying parents. So, Tierra, because Christ died and rose for you, and you've put your trust in him, it's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, come on, Passion City. If you only knew the half of it, and only heaven really does. It's just so miraculous. But you know, when Passion City Church was planted in the 515 neighborhood of Atlanta, our hope and prayer was that we would be light in a neighborhood that has a lot of darkness. That we would be a city on a hill that people could see when they needed hope. There's a lot of peaks in our neighborhoods. There's some peaks in our 515 neighborhood, but there are a lot of low, low lows in our neighborhood. But God, but God, I was sitting right in that gathering and when Tierra shared her story, her parents were standing there. I was thinking, oh my word. All it takes is a simple prayer. 
Jesus, I need you. I was driving home and it just hit me. Tierra. Tierra. A tiara. It's a crown. I was thinking when her parents named her, they were thinking, this is our princess. Our daughter is a princess. She's royal. She's going to live above and not below. She's going to have a future and a hope. This is Tierra. We're speaking over her from the moment she's born. And then all of a sudden, decisions, circumstances, and she's living in a, a motel room by herself at the end, rock bottom, low as you can go. No crown. But you know what she had? She had a mom who was praying for her. And she had a dad who haven't given up on her. And she had a God who was willing to come to the low. So from the lowest place, she called on the highest name. From the lowest place, you can call on the highest name. the one who came for that very thing. I'll say this and we'll close. This was Jesus. These are the words he chose when he announced on earth what he had come to do. He reached back to the prophet Isaiah and he read these words. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. I'm driving home in my car and I am blowing up. I'm having a second service worship moment. The second gathering worship moment. Sorry, I just came from a church. I had services. <laughs> and I'm thinking about these words. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Jesus said, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, are you ready, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness or despair. A tiara for ashes. And that's what God is doing today. So I don't know what your low season is. Maybe it's bad decisions, bad choices. Maybe you're isolated and broken down and feel like because of the mountain of shame you're looking at, there's never going to be a tomorrow. Or maybe it's just circumstances that were out of your control, a diagnosis that you didn't see coming. Maybe you've been abandoned by somebody or wronged by somebody or maybe depression just has crept in and taken over and there is no impressing, it's just depressing and you're in the low, low, low. I'm telling you, even in the low, 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 you still have breath today and with that breath, you have a choice today not to go back to that thing or to something or to somebody or to that well or to give up, but to say from the lowest place, I'm going to call today on the highest name. 
And in this season, this barren season, I'm gonna put God first. If you are at the peak today, put him first. Give him glory, give him praise, give him honor. Humble yourself before him. Recognize and acknowledge that he's the one who elevated you to the peak. But if you are in the valley today, God is in the valley. And he's not expecting you to get out of it by yourself. He's expecting to meet you there if you call on his name. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, the name of the Lord shall be praised. With the first fruits of everything God has blessed me with, I will repay and invest in his kingdom and his righteousness. And whatever season I'm in, if I'm waiting, if I'm longing, if I feel like I'm in a detour or dead end or my plane got diverted to the different airport, whatever it is right now, I'm going to honor him in this season. I don't know how long the season is, but I'm going to put God first. I don't love the season, but I'm going to put God first. This is the season I've always wanted. I'm going to put God first. Whatever season, wherever I am, I'm going to put God first. I'm going to put him first. I really believe today that there are a lot of Tierra stories that God's going to turn around in this day because there's a lot of prayer stored up. That picture in Revelation, it says there's a golden bowl in heaven. You know, all this symbolism, we don't know all of what all of it means, but it said there's a golden bowl in heaven and it's filled with incense rising up to God. And listen, it's filled with the prayers of the saints. So you may be in the low, but there's a bowl and in it are the prayers of the people who've been praying for you. You're like, my mama never prayed for me. My daddy didn't know the Lord. Well, I'm telling you, I bet somebody's prayed for you. And if nobody else has prayed for you, this word says Jesus has interceded for you. And his prayer is in that bowl. And you know what they're praying for? They're praying that out of the low that you will open your mouth and put God first. That from the lowest place you'll call on the highest name. 